Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. Today we're going to take a look at this Sagem Montanel uh, F-Post pin pad terminal. You might call them uh, something else in your country, but we call them basically uh, F-Post terminals here, or uh, pin pads, because I used to work at the company who actually supplied this key corp. I worked there back in 94, although I wasn't in the pin pad group. I designed the uh, TFT LCD monitors for these type of banking systems back then. Anyway, this is not a Keycorp branded model. It's uh, produced by uh, Sagem. I'll link in the data sheet for it down below, but it's one of these typical FPOS terminals. Not a particularly recent one, but recent enough to have a smart card interface on here, and it's also a GSM model. We'll find that out. In fact, ta-da! There we go. It's got some uh, SIM three SIM card slots down there. I'm not sure why there are actually uh, three there, and there's an SD card slot in there. Anyway, so you can use this as a remote terminal, and uh, it connects and does your electronic uh, credit card transaction at your point of sale. And thanks to Luke Stone for sending this one into the mailbag. He scored it for two bucks at a local garage sale. Fantastic. So let's tear down this thing and see what's inside. Now the interesting thing about these uh, pin pad FPOS terminals is basically the security inside of them. And I'm not talking software security, I'm talking hardware uh, anti-tamper security because it's very important for these things not to be hackable. So you know somebody can't uh, just buy one one commercially on the market or access one like this or steal one or whatever and then hack it and put their own uh, circuitry inside of their own software or whatever to then steal people's uh, credit card numbers and pin numbers and things like that. So we expect lots of anti-tamper technology inside this thing and there's industry standards uh, for this. This particular one meets the uh, PCI PED standard and no PCI doesn't stand for your regular computer PCI slot. It stands for the payment card industry and they're the uh, regulatory body that handle uh, the security standards both software and hardware and also management uh, for these things. So it's PCI PED standard so payment card industry PED standard for pin entry device, which is what the industry term is for one of these, but we'll just call it FPOS terminal because that's what they're called here in Australia. Um, FPOS, if you don't know, is electronic funds transfer at point of sale. There you go. Um, and there are various standards for this. Uh, we're gonna, this is um, meets the PED standard for the pin entry device, but there's uh, separate standards for the uh, the DSS standard for the data security standard. It stands for like uh, the protocol, the interface in, and the key generation and all that sort of stuff. And I think you have to like buy the standards or something like that. I don't think they're readily downloadable, but if they are, please uh, link them in and uh, or leave a comment and I'll link them in down below. Anyway, I'm going to link in the data sheet for this thing. I'm not sure of the exact age. We'll uh, find out. But yeah, as I said, it's got a smart card interface. It's got a card reader down there. You swipe your card. You can hardly see that, but there's a little... There's the reading head down in there. We'll see that when we open it up. Graphical LCD screen. Um, and it comes with this uh, cable which has both an Ethernet uh, interface here. So it does um, IP, like you can connect to a regular internet connection and it can do your transaction that way, which is faster than your regular modem. This will also have a... Um, uh, v32 uh, modem in it as well um, and it's also got RS232 uh, interface plus it's also got that wireless uh, capability with the uh, SIM card as well. So maybe you can uh, attach like an optional battery pack on here, dealer fitted or something like that. Maybe you turn it into a portable device, I don't know. Or maybe it's just a complete leaded device. Anyway, it's got three different methods to um, uh, actually do the uh, transaction, SIM wireless, uh, Ethernet and uh, dial-up as well. Got a couple of USB ports on here, device and host, that I believe is used for the upgrade of the firmware in this thing. You can actually plug a cable in and plug in a USB key and you can do your uh, firmware upgrades and field upgrades that way. So should be really interesting, But and it's got a printer as well. It's just got a little uh, cheap-ass uh, thermal, uh, simple thermal printer in the thing, and a security, uh, looks like a security locking uh, tab or something like that. So we really want to find out what the anti-tamper mechanisms in this thing. That's going to be the fascinating bit that I want to see. I don't particularly care what processor it uses, although these things often use a, uh, a secure 
uh, processor, a specific uh, hardened security processor that has uh, self-destruct mechanisms and things like that, uh, anti-tamper devices built into the processor. Not a regular one. It says it does use a 32-bit uh, RISC ARM9 uh, micro at 200 MIPS in there to do that, but it also says it has a coprocessor, so I expect the coprocessor to be a security uh, hardened processor. So this model is the EFT930S Sagem Monotel, and we'll find out the date when we open it. There'll no doubt be uh, some chips in there, but yeah, like it's got a date of, you know, supplied by Keycorp in 2010, but when it was uh, designed and serviced, you know, it's at least four or five year old, so, um, which isn't too bad. So there we go, that's like a half turn system, you have to uh, do that and pull at the same time. Ah, there we go. That's just a uh, cable interface. So that's got our RS separate RS-232 uh, Ethernet and it had the USB host. I think that one's for the firmware, so not entirely sure what the... Ah, uh, th these are the devices over here, but anyway, so you can probably do firmware updates through there. RS-232 host and ah, power. And yeah, I could picture there maybe being a battery uh, pack optional extra for that if you just wanted to use the uh, sim module no problems and I don't really know about the uh, GPRS uh, modem inside this thing and the sim cards here whether or not you know you can just whack any regular sim card in there and how that's actually uh, handled on the uh, client side and all that the payment gateway and all that uh, sort of jazz I guess you would uh, have to be in the industry to know those kind of things but uh, anyway let's see how we can open it so six of those but as i said as soon as we take this case off i expect there to be at an absolute bare minimum uh anti-tamper uh switch in there and built into the case perhaps that as soon as we open the case it's going to destroy the uh contents of the um of the uh, keys and things like that but there's probably multiple layers of uh, tamper protection in here not just that so Let's open it. No, it turns out they're torque screws. I should be able to find the right size one in here. Should keep them organised. Alright, I've taken out the six screws in. Hey, there we go. We broke our little uh, security seal there. Not surprising. And what do we got? Yep, there we go. There's our first. Yep, there's our first anti-tamper. There we go. Tactile switch down in there. That's our first anti-tamper mechanism. So yeah, there, there it is. There's the little uh, button which pushes down on that tab. So bingo, all the, uh, we've probably screwed the pooch already. If you wanted to get the security uh, keys out of this or whatever, you've probably already lost them. And you at, a, at a minimum, you'd probably have to go back to the uh, official dealer and get it reprogrammed or recommissioned or whatever, um, however that works. We've got ourselves a 3 volt uh, lithium battery there, and no doubt a lot of this stuff is going to be stored in SRAM. Uh, it won't be stored in flash, so you'd expect to find like the keys and things in SRAM so that they can easily be uh, destroyed at a moment's notice when you, you know, uh, enter, violate any one of the uh, tamper mechanisms inside this thing. Now, curiously, um, a massive 4700 mic 10 volt surface mount cap. Look at that. Easter there. So they really want to retain that um, uh, data. Well, uh, I, I reckon that's maybe that's uh, for like, I don't know, some internal real time clock or something. And maybe that battery only powers the uh, keys and uh, other uh, encryption uh, type data, perhaps. And this uh, cap, reservoir cap, just uh, keeps maybe the timing date going for. Uh, a long time when it when the power is disconnected perhaps I'm not entirely sure and we have ourselves a pulse transformer there for the Ethernet interface and we've got our recording head over here our RS-232 our USB uh, host over there something that's not populated over here so I don't know whether or not that's a factory test or some sort of optional thing maybe it's uh, part of it no it, yeah it's something else um, so it could be a uh, optional model fit. Couple of parts missing all around here. Not entirely sure. Another big uh, surface mount cap missing here. So not entirely sure what's uh, what's missing around these parts here. And I thought there wasn't any screws holding that in place. So I just pulled on it and boop, off it came. Yeah, it's got a huge board-to-board -board interconnect here. This plastic 
Got a plastic shield there. Not sure, like a spacer. I'm not sure why they bother putting a spacer in there. Is there some sort of anti-tamper mechanism in that? Maybe not. Anyway, we've got a large amount of uh, shielding around here. So, oh, yeah, there we go. Now, given that uh, shielding on the back there and the large amount of via stitching, that indicates, uh, well, <laughs> A, uh, shielding and all the ground plane uh, flood fill on the top as well and all the via stitching, low impedance stuff, that indicates high frequency stuff is at play here. So I'm thinking this, well, has got to be, uh, really, there's no option. It's got to be the optional, uh, by the looks of it, not fitted to this, the uh, GPRS uh, module. So these sims... Um, are of no use to this, uh, presumably, because there's no uh, wireless GPRS uh, functionality not fitted. Now, whether or not um, there's, you know, it looks like there's some circuitry on there, whether or not there's maybe another board, and there's got to be like an antenna somewhere, because I don't see an antenna in this uh, case at all. So that's all optional, unfortunately. By the way, we have a date code down in there, 36 week 07. So whether or not it's old stock or whether or not it actually uh, came from the, uh, it was manufactured around, you know, late 07, um, 08, something like that. Not sure. Now, I just thought for a minute, uh, maybe this was the uh, modem stuff and this hadn't been uh, uh, populated in this one, but like there's no isolation there or... Uh, anything like that, you'd expect, you know, isolation relay, isolation slots, dedicated isolated section for a uh, V32 uh, modem that hooks up to the phone line. So, yeah, that doesn't seem to be uh, in there, or at least not on the top of anything inside here that we can see so far. And we have a Viacom DM9161 chipset there with its own dedicated uh, oscillator. Of course, that's all for the Ethernet, the physical uh, aspect of the Ethernet interface. And that one there is just a Joe Bloggs RS232 uh, interface driver. Now, why they've got a second huge pin count board-to-board -board interconnect connector there, I have no idea. It looks like a finer pin pitch than we've got here, so I don't know. It's not something you'd ordinarily use for testing, so maybe it's part of the uh, development and uh, debug, something like that. And there's nothing fancy happening in most of this. That's clearly a power switch mode uh, power supply there. Dead giveaway is that, uh, yeah, it's surrounded by an optional shield, which they haven't decided to fit. And when you see big uh, power inductors like that and a big tantalum cap and a little uh, chip next to it controlling it, yeah, and a couple of um, uh, high-value uh, ceramic uh, caps like that in a large package, you know that like uh, to get very low uh, ESR on the output that a switch mode re uh, controller requires. It's a dead giveaway. And we've got ourselves a beeper up there by the looks of it. And well, not much else happening. Just some miscellaneous stuff down here for the uh, USB interfaces over here. Now, the thing I'm very surprised at is that I can still only see one anti-tamper mechanism, and that was the little tactile switch there, which we saw when we opened the case. I expected the uh, processing... Is that, I'm not sure what that is. We'll get in and have a look anyway. It looks like we've got some RAM and some flash there. Um, that, this is all, you know, I expected this to be either physically potted or protected with some sort of extra any tamper uh, mechanism in some uh, respect, or at least make it uh, physically difficult to access by just uh, potting the stuff anyway. But no, no, they've just put in a, a half ass uh, shield over that. And, uh, well, we can read the part numbers straight off there. Hmm. And clearly, there's our ARM A9 processor, but that's not the brand, that's the model, uh, Mon EFT 3X. So, you know, they're just using an off-the-shelf ARM uh, processor, as they said. Um, what was it, a RISC uh, ARM 9 at uh, 200 uh, MIPS? So, yeah, they're just rebadging that when you buy enough of them. The rebadge, date code again, 34th week 07. So there you go. Um, you know, it's unlikely that two chips are going to be from uh, 07, especially a processor like this. They generally don't leave those sitting around in uh, stock for all that long on uh, products like this. So I reckon, yeah, it's, you know, manufactured in uh, late 07 or 08, but uh, key cop of whack to that uh, 2010 sticker on it, was it? Although, actually, come to think of it, no, it's not that surprising that this is uh, not secured in any way, because this is just the applications processor. We haven't gotten to the secure processor yet. So that's probably on the other side of the board, making it even more difficult to, you know, uh, hack and get into, because you've got to take out the second board. So that co has got to be on the back of this board somewhere, and that could have extra anti-tamper stuff. 
And there's our magnetic uh, recording head down in there. It's just like your regular uh, tape-based, uh, you know, cassette tape for you youngsters out there. Like a regular head, maybe, uh, possibly, you know, specifically designed for uh, credit card scanning and things like that. Nothing fancy. The thing I found a bit surprising is that, is that a little bit compliant? Yeah, it could be. Usually they build some uh, physical compliance into this thing, hence the flex coming out. And uh, usually, you know, they want to uh, get some uh, a bit of compliance in the pressure that this head puts across the credit card that you actually swipe into this thing. So, yeah, I think that's what this metal plate here can be doing, just giving it a little bit of, little bit of pressure and some give against the card. And I was about to say that these metal, look, there's metal pins in there and there. I thought, aha, maybe that's some extra anti-tamper or something, maybe some conductive uh, thing. But I can't find any matching uh, thing in the top case here. So I thought maybe that was an extra anti-tamper mechanism, but obviously not. So I don't know why they've put metal pins in there, maybe to, yeah, to hold in the uh, uh, card slot here for the smart card but yeah I don't know and there's the head for the thermal printer there and yeah they do have one individual pixel so it's all the way across I don't know how many uh, pixels I'd have across there but there's one individual thermal element which then just burns the uh, heats up and burns a dot in the thermal paper as it passes through looks like we've got some gear mechanism gearing mechanism over here tiny little motor on the back there but yeah nothing much doing there they're pretty simple and in fact all of that just bingo, popped out of there on a flat flex. No problems at all. So you could actually, if you're really keen, you could keep that and uh, reuse that. There, are, they're likely, they usually have like a driver. I've shown these before in previous videos on the flat flex here. Usually an embedded uh, driver uh, in there to actually uh, drive the elements. There's specific uh, chips you can get and they're usually uh, only available in uh, die form for attaching directly onto the uh, flat flex. I think to open the rest of this, I think it just sort of like, oh, look, that whole side panel. There you go. That, hey, there you go, that whole side panel. Oops. I just, look at that, snapped. <laughs> snapped the flat flex, just sheared right off, because this is a thicker part of the flat flex down here that uh, goes into there, and this is thinner. So, yeah, <laughs> no, uh, no surprise that it actually sheared off at that point. So... I think the whole thing just lifts out, and as I said, I reckon there's probably another going to be another switch on the bottom here, which will, if we have our keys, secure keys, encryption, and all that sort of jazz, whatever it needs, hasn't been erased already. It most likely is when we get that out. Bingo. Now here's an interesting aspect to this thing. Of course, there are uh, two ways to uh, hack the well, at least two ways to hack these things. One is to actually get in to the actual uh, circuitry itself, and you know, get the steal the keys and all that sort of uh, jazz, and you know, maybe hijack your own circuitry on there. All that sort of you know, really uh, deeply complex stuff. The other simple way is to hack in to the magnetic stripe reader like that, so tap off that and read the signal directly from the card, and then also add some uh, circuitry, you know, like a little, if you want to hack these, you might add on a little board or something like that, to read the keypad like this. So you're basically stealing the um, information directly, all, all you need, you don't have to worry about, you know, defeating the encryption mechanism and all that sort of stuff with the keys, all you need to steal is the magnetic card info and the pe people's pin numbers, as they actually type them in. And I think that's the majority of uh, hacks on these uh, type of things. But if you've got more info on that. Anyway, so there's two ways to get into this thing. One is through the back of the case, which we saw before, and the other is through the membrane keypad on the front here. Now, you'll notice, you know, it's just a regular membrane keypad and there's conductive pads here, which then make contact to our regular buttons. You've seen this before, common in, common as mud, every single product, but look, it's got two additional little contacts there and there that don't mate up uh, with a uh, button on the front. But look, they have a little little, little pin in there moulded into the plastic case, which then pushes on this and acts as a button when this thing is finally assembled. And look at that. We've got two pads there and there on the board. Bingo, that's another anti-tamper mechanism. So if you try and remove that membrane keypad, 
bingo, it's going to destroy it and lose the keys, do whatever. And uh, once these things, you have to basically send them back to the dealer or the factory or whatever to get them uh, reprogrammed, if that's even possible at all, after you open these things. Maybe not. These things aren't designed to be uh, serviced. They're designed to be assembled, secure. They've got to meet all those um, international uh, security requirements, all that sort of jazz. So there you go. We've now um, <laughs> uh, already uh, released two anti-tamper mechanisms in this thing. And under there is an on-semiconductor NCN644A. That's the driver chip for, or the interface chip for the uh, SIM modules, those three SIM modules we uh, saw on the backside. And that's got ESD uh, protection built in because the SIM modules, of course, are easily accessible by uh, human fingers. So, you know, you, can, you don't want to uh, kill your main input chip here. And you'll notice all the uh, better nails test pins all the way around here for production testing. Now, once again, this uh, coprocessor, this is the secure coprocessor. And once again, I'm surprised that it's not potted or has any other anti-tamper mechanism in there. And look, it's a, um, once again, it's got their own uh, brand on there. It's uh, Mon EFT uh, 3X specifically for this model, but they, they're not spinning their own silicon there. I guarantee it. They're just reusing an off-the-shelf uh, secure microcontroller. That won't be a regular one. A couple of companies around specialize in doing secure microcontrollers specifically for this uh, purpose. And they will often have like a self-destruct pin on them so that the uh, encryption keys, which are kept in uh, SRAM, uh, are destroyed if you don't keep that pin you know, powered up or whatever. Now, this could have been like a modern uh, one, like, say, Maxim, for example, do a Max uh, 32550 uh, secure microcontroller that does all the AES, DES, you know, uh, secure key encryption, all that sort of stuff. It's got uh, temperature and voltage uh, tamper mechanisms and all sorts of fantastic stuff to ensure that you can't, uh, you know, hack and extract the uh, keys from this thing. But um, that's only available in a BGA package. But I did find an an older school uh, Dallas semiconductor, of course, uh, Dallas owned by Maxim now, and I think this thing, because it's a 100-pin uh, TQFP, I think it's a Dallas uh, DS5240. I can't get the pinouts for this because you need an NDA, shock horror, to actually get the full data sheet, but I'll link in down below just the basic uh, top-level data sheet for this thing. So that's what I think it is, Dallas Semiconductor DS5240. 40 perhaps it's an 8051 uh, processor by the way that previous maxim one that had a, a um, uh, arm cortex m3 but something like this D is 5240, old school 8051 processor, but can access like up to 8 mega RAM, but it's got like 4096 bit encryption in there. It's got uh, physical uh, protection as well. It's got like a pattern that they embed in there over the die. So if you physically try and like eat away, like actually dissolve away at the plastic, assuming that you got through all the anti-tamper mechanisms on this thing, if you were actually able to dissolve the plastic on there, there'd be like a physical... Uh, metal barrier over the uh, top of the encryption area of the chip, not over the entire chip, but probably just the encryption area of the chip that actually holds the keys. And it's all SRAM based, it's all very fast SRAM, which they uh, talk about, so that, you know, if it uh, detects any sort of uh, temperature tampering, voltage tampering, uh, memory bus uh, tampering, things like that, uh, probing, all those sorts of mechanisms, it'll just erase the keys in there and bingo, your data is uh, lost. So this chip in its own right probably has adequate security in there to meet the uh, those international security standards we talk about at the start. But I was just, uh, you know, I'm very disappointed that there wasn't extra security like uh, that was like fully potted or something like that, just to make it just that belt and braces engineering approach, you know. I mean, yeah, this chip can do it on its own, but just would have been nicer to see some extra security in there, perhaps. But I don't know. Um, yeah, it obviously meets the standards, so it's all approved, all that sort of jazz. And really, the odds of you being able to hack this thing, uh, like in terms of the encryption keys and things like that, are oh, borderline zero. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed the look inside one of these uh, FPOS 
pin pad uh, terminals. And yes, there is a lot of security which goes into these, uh, probably, you know, more on chip, on die stuff than anything else. You know, we've got some basic stuff protecting the keypad and opening the case for those physical attacks. As I said, a hacker wouldn't be bothered trying to get, you know, the keys out of this or hack that processor in any way. It's just too hard. If they were going to try and hack these things, then they'd, you know, be uh, detecting the uh, keypad presses and reading your magnetic uh, strip reader. And that's, you know, you hear reports of, uh, yeah, people have uh, snuck well, not, not snuck in, they just do like sleight of hand. So what they do is they case the place uh, first that they want to target. They've already hacked one of these uh, matching pin pads to what's in a store and uh, everything else just to like steal the um, the credit card, the basically the pin number and the uh, credit card uh, info on there. And uh, they just, you know, go into the store, sleight of hand, they just, you know, disconnect it. Somebody distracts the attendant while the other one, uh, you know, physically swaps over the unit. So then you've got a hacked uh, unit installed and nobody's none the wiser. Then they come back later and they steal it and it's uh, captured all of that data. That's one of the ways that uh, these things are often uh, hacked anyway. But yeah, really quite difficult to do. The uh, security on these things is really pretty good. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed a look inside these uh, pin pads. Uh, uh, data sheets are linked in down below. So check them out. And if you like Teardown Tuesday, please give it a big thumbs up. And um, as always, the EEV blog forum is the place to discuss it, but YouTube is cool too, or the eevblog.com website. Catch you next time.